Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog I will show you the interview that I did with Sander Kleinenberg about his classic My Lexicon. Enjoy! Sander Kleinenberg was born in Delft, the Netherlands, on December 29, 1971. He started with DJing at the age of 15 in a local bar where he did play all kinds of musical genres. Later he started to focus more on dance music and not long after that he also started with producing music. In 1993 his first release came out which was a track he did together with a few friends under the project name Free Frogs. In 1999 he finished a track which was called My Lexicon and that one became his big breakthrough. Not long after that Sander started his own label called Little Mountain Recordings where he released tracks such as The Fruit and This Is Miami amongst others. Besides a popular producer and DJ Sander also got to remix plenty of big names such as Justin Timberlake. NERD, Janet Jackson, Madonna, Junkie XL, BT, Royxop, System F and lots of others. For this week's vlog I sat down with Sander to talk with him about his classic My Lexicon, his future plans and more. My first question to him was at what age he started to listen to dance music. Um, well I mean I guess if you consider all music to be some sort of dance music it'll be all my life but um uh, if we're talking about modern electronic dance music, I would say I was probably 15, 14, somewhere around that era. I was into early hip hop, uh, so um, uh, probably like Planet, Planet Rock, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, or some of that early electro uh, stuff uh, that was coming out in New York and Miami and, and Detroit. Hip hop was like my first sort of love uh, around sort of the late 80s, sort of 88, 89. And how did you discover that kind of music? Was it via the radio or? Yeah, it was totally radio. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sure every Dutch DJ of my incredibly old age will, will tell you that Thursday nights there was a radio show called The Soul Show. And, um, you know, it gave you a little glimpse of what I thought was, you know, the future and something incredible, like a sort of like a, a you know, uh, a sound from the future uh, calling me. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so so Ferry Matt, he was the DJ on the Thursday night, and it was just so exciting. Everything about it was just was just incredible. Yeah. Was this also around the same time you started with producing music yourself? No, not at all. No, I um, like I said. I, I mean, I was 14. Um, I was going to school. Uh, didn't really fit it in at all. Uh, and this music was like a, a genuine, you know, adolescent escape, you know, from reality and from you know just uh, being different than 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 other, than other kids. I think. I think dance music back then wasn't really a, uh, you know, obviously not a mainstream phenomena. So. Uh, so it was. It was more of a. It was more of a, more more of an escape. So it wasn't professional. It was about five five years later when I first started to uh, dabble in producing and um, starting my you know my first steps, making my first steps into the music business. The track that really gave your career a huge boost was definitely My Lexicon, a track you finished 20 years ago in the year 1999. What can you tell us from the production process of the track? Um, well, I remember back in the days, I used to just um, work on loops and ideas for days and days and days and days. I mean, it must have been uh, something that that I had probably started like a, a week before or two weeks before I finished it, and, and it probably morphed during the process into something different. Um, you really had to sort of work on one track at a time. You couldn't work on ten different tracks because your settings in your mix desk and and your synths and everything, uh, you know, you could only find once. And, and so it was like a, probably like a process that, that uh, took a few long days, you know, 16 hour days. Uh, I do remember when it was finished, my, my studio was in, um, uh, at a record label in uh, The Hague. Um, and uh, the record label was called Combined Forces and that had a couple of labels and this record was uh, released on, 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 that, on that label. And I remember it was like nine in the morning and the first guys walked into the office going to work like you know it's like a daytime job you know like you, you would you would you would you know sell records to the world and and i had just finished one 
And I, I remember Jorn, who's now the head A&R at Spinning Records, uh, being the first one to, um, to open the door. And he was just like, oh my God, you're here? And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm still here. You know, I, this, is a, this has been an all-nighter, but you have to sit down and listen to this tune. So I think Jorn is probably the first person in the world that ever heard Monexicon. And look what it brought him, man. He's one of the biggest A&Rs in the world now. So, you know, that's what it did. <laughs> thanks, you, thanks, Jorn, for, for every year sending me the postcard, remembering that moment. Where did the inspiration for my lexicon came from? Um, I think uh, the, the general inspiration was just trying to fit in and trying to um, find a sound that sort of was close to me um and that sort of would fit into the world and was kind of happening and kind of sort of like uh, uh something that uh yeah that, that would inspire the dance floors that i was inspired by at that particular moment and and would be played by the djs that i looked up to i mean i think that was the the whole idea you know um the title was inspired by the fact that i had always wanted to work with vocals and i, I always wanted to become like a pop producer i wanted to you know make pop music and big songs and all that but if you live in the Netherlands and you're, you know, trying to sort of, you know, do something uh, uh, musically, then your best shot would be to not work with vocals because <laughs> because there's not a lot of uh, great, amazing, you know, talented vocalists in, 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 in such a small country. And then secondly, you need to speak the language really well. And um, so there's always that thick accent. I mean, a few got away. I mean, obviously we have the golden earring or Fox the Fox or some people that, that that, uh, or Vessel van Diepen, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, but I never got a chance to, uh, to really nurture a relationship with a singer or, or... so my next event was my way of singing, my words, like uh, that melody and uh, the bass line and the change and all the emotions that are in that song were my way of expressing myself. And that's what it, what it was and I think that's what it still is, yeah. It has a really long build up, huh? Yeah, I think back in the day, um, records were genuinely a lot longer than they are now um, and so I, th I think I think the focus of people on the dance floor was uh, the attention span was was a bit longer uh, and specifically with this with this type of music and the DJs that played this music it was it was back then uh, championed by the you know the biggest DJs in the world Sasha and John Dickweed and you know they, they were the the, the, the the Martin Garrixes and the Chesters of, of, of that era um, yeah, and, and they and they would have four or five, six hour sets and, you know, they would build uh, their sets and it would be like a really sort of exciting and, and sort of almost cinematic sort of experience. And you got to remember back in 99, you know, you, you wouldn't have a cell phone or you'd look like a real ridiculous idiot with a huge cell phone on the desk. Uh, but it wasn't like you could check your, um, you know, your, your, uh, your grandmother uh, online. Uh, so... So there was just more, yeah, there's more attention, more and more, more focus. What kind of equipment was used for the track? Um, well, I worked with a, with a Macintosh. I think, I think one of the earlier Macintoshes um, worked with the uh, S2500 Akai sampler, which had like a, a minute of sampling that was mono, so you had 30 seconds stereo. You had to be clever on panning, you know, if you wanted to have, a, you know, a cool little drum uh, set up, you had to be clever on how much time you used, uh, you know, to sort of program your, your sampler. Um, it was done with the DX7, there was a Juno 106, uh, I think the DX7 did the bass line, which is uh, Jama um, RS7, which is this weird blue um, Yamaha synth, uh, that's where the melody came from. Uh, a couple of lexicons actually for the reverb, uh, some focus right compressing, big old Mackie 328 mixing desk, you know, so it was like a classic sort of, you know, MIDI uh, home studio setup, you know, with, uh, yeah. Do you remember how long it took you to finish my lexicon? Yeah, a couple of weeks. I think, I think to be honest, it's like whenever you have a record that stands out and really sort of captures a moment, it's usually a journey that took years you know it's like you you kind of sort of i mean in my in my in my case i, I kind of work for for years towards a certain sound and then i kind of hopefully perfect it in one shape or other and then something happens uh that is sort of brings it all together and then 
you create a record that's like, oh my God, you know, it's like with Can You Feel It? Um, that was, I was really inspired by, by sort of Future House and so that sort of whole revival and the big stabby sort of funky sound that was going on. And I had done a couple of records that have tried to sort of be that and then all of a sudden, you know, you do something and, it's, and it sort of clicks and it's like, oh yeah, cool, you know, and then, and that's my lexicon as well. My lexicon is like the accumulation of many years in the studio and trying to perfect something and then all of a sudden it sort of kind of really works. So how long did I take? Specifically, this process may have been a week or two, um, but I think in general, creating something that lasts the test of time takes a couple of years to, to mold and put together. When it was finished, did you already have a feeling this could be big? Yeah, I, I knew it, no. <laughs> now from the start, like I knew this is the shit. Like I have just done, no, no, not really. Also because you, uh, if you, what I just said about, you know, the years of, of you know, finessing something or, or fine tuning something until it becomes something like my lexicon in that process, it's really difficult to, to point out where you are and at what, at what particular point does it really hit. Um, and I think also what records like that really show you is that uh, creating a hit record or, or having a record that sort of somehow sort of um, captures time really well, which I think is what good records do. Um, you never really know how, you know, and until you're a few years away on, you know, how and and what it really meant and, and how it, put, it was put together. And, and when you're in that position, you do understand that, yes, you may have made that record, but there's so many elements around records like that that make it uh, become what they become in the end, you know, because there's a lot of records that may have the same quality and maybe have the same idea and maybe have the same sort of um, freshness to them, but they don't become as big as, as some other records. So it's time and place. It's like who supports it, what time of, which momentum and, you know, where are you? And, you know, that, that also helps uh, uh, creating a record like that. Speaking of support, my lexicon got featured on the Global Underground Ibiza compilation by Sasha. Was he the first DJ to support the track? Funny enough, uh, one of those uh, uh, people that really made that record become what it what it became was was Sasha, as you just mentioned. I think he w he was someone who uh, you know who's there for me at that particular moment in in my career and particular moment of my sort of uh, development of where I was musically that that really truly inspired me and um, and it and it helped me um, create that record to a certain extent as well. Like. Um, I read the other day on a, on a blog um, about how artists that become famous, how, how important it is for them to know other people that are in that same realm. And, and so the, the article was a bit cynical because it kind of stated like, oh, you will never become famous if you don't surround yourself with fame. I think it's kind of like the other way around. I think, I think fame or recognition or yeah, the greatness is a big word because uh, that just happens to be time and place, but um, um, these kind of records and these kind of moments, yeah, they, they have a collective of momentum around them for them to, 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 to really grow. Anyway, uh, so Sasha was really a really important element to it and him putting it on that uh, CD, uh, I mean back then that was a huge deal because he was the biggest DJ in the world and it wasn't like they had mix shows or on the, they were not on the internet every week or day if you wanted to that you had to really wait until these cds came out and then it was really exciting like oh my god what's going to be on those cds and on this particular one there were two tracks of mine you know which was like okay who's this guy you know and it, and it obviously gave me an, a tremendous calling card like a like a platform to 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 work from and ended up making me who i am today do you actually remember playing the track yourself at a gig for the very first time um, no, but I do remember going to the Love Parade in Berlin, which is weird because the record came out in December, so this is probably not true. <laughs> uh, but what I do vividly remember was that Sasha played it at the Love Parade in, uh, in Berlin that summer, I guess, so, so six months later. And that was truly, like, incredible. I mean, it was 2000, the Love Parade was huge and, and it, was a, it was a big deal. Um, and the record obviously ended up being signed by Pitong and um, yeah, it was ex exciting times, it was good. The retail release came out in the year 2000. Are there any plans for a re-release for the 20th anniversary? So it's going to be 20 years. Um, 
and we're gonna do a, a, re, a re-release. So we asked some people to, to remix it, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, but it's also a bit daunting because as an artist, you don't want to be remembered too much about you know what has happened in the past. And you're actually, I mean, I have been continuously searching for new ways of trying to get that message across and new ways to capture energy and new ways to be current and relevant. Um, I'm never one to dwell too much in the past. Like I could never do, I mean, there's a lot of producers out there that do it really well. They could do a hundred records in the same sound and in the same direction and they're hugely successful. And I envy these people because they, you know, they're, they're incredible at, at what they do. But I always wanted to reinvent myself. I always wanted to sort of be some, somebody else than I was three years ago, or five years ago to the frustration of many of my managers and many people around me, it's just who I am. I want to be and want to stay inspired, even if it means blowing up what I've done in the past. So revisiting something is going to be the first time I'm doing it. Um, but the record has meant so much for so many people. And I think that's something that um, is an emotion that I have nothing to do with because I, I made the record and I captured that particular moment in time. It was just me sort of translating energy into that moment. Um, but then when it became so big, it's like now it's also, it's not only mine anymore, it's also in the memories of so many people and it made an impact for a lot of people. And so I got to respect that and, and, and give them a revisit, you know, so, yeah. There has been a remix of My Lexicon, which was done by Cass and Slide, but that one never got a release. Do you know why? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, because, um, because we didn't think it was good enough, I guess, you know? Um, and we didn't want to, yeah, we didn't want to sort of jinx the original too much, like, um, and there's been some other remixes where I was like, ah, oh, sh- I shouldn't have done, I should not have done that, you know, because it's, it's just, yeah, it's just not, sometimes it's just like, you got to keep it, keep it where it is because, it, you know, that's just, that's just what it is. If you have to pick one favorite memory you have from the release of My Lexicon, what would that be and why? I mean, you know, it's got to be the, the fact that it's that it's opened the door to me. Um, in the conversation we had before, I told you, like, uh, I had a record in 96 that did really well. It was called You Do Me Wrong. I did it with a friend of mine from The Hague, and we released it on the, on the same label as My Lexicon was released. And it was, apparently, I found out years later, huge, in specifically in New York. Like, there was one DJ called Junior Vasquez, and he played it for a whole summer back-to-back for, like, 20 minutes every night. It was the song in New York. And I never, I mean, I never knew. Otherwise, I may have been an arrogant bastard. Like, <laughs> I never knew that that record had that effect. I knew it was doing well, and we knew it was number one in the, the Hague dance chart, you know, and maybe it was in the dance top 20 in the Netherlands. And you could sort of monitor maybe a few charts around the world, but you didn't know what happened in New York unless you you were there. Uh, and this is obviously pre-internet, like pre-data, you know. And uh, and on the one hand, that's that's really great, and on the on the other hand, it's, it's a shame. But um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what did, what did I want to say? Um, yeah, I totally forgot what I wanted to say. It was a good story, though, wasn't it? I loved it. Yeah, it was good. Anyway, beer. <laughs> so, um, so, it, so it obviously opened, opened, opened a, a door in a, in a way that uh, uh, wasn't done, wasn't done before, and it was time and place because the internet broke, broke, uh, it, you know, in a first first adapter world, and it really gave me a name around the world, and it, and it made me become a part of the, the the world sort of you know DJ elite flying around the world, which has been incredible. After my lexicon, you changed your style and you had some hits with tracks such as The Fruit and This Is Miami, for example. Yeah. What was the reason for this change? No, but I mean, but this is, there's no, there's, I understand that you're saying, oh, well, after my lexicon, but there was also a before my lexicon and I just stated, you know, there were hit records and there were great moments. And um, so my lexicon was just like an explosion that just happened and it's uncontrollable uh, source of energy that, that was behind this, this particular record. It became, you know, uh, a record that uh, um, it became like a uh, one of the ten records that um, created a sound, I guess. You know, were, were synonymous with a, with a whole sound, which is which is like incredible. But it's not something that you can do a lot about. It just it just happens. So 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 there's two things you can do. You can either follow that 
and you can go like, oh, you know what, this is, been, this is so amazing, I'm just gonna do this for the next 20 years. But I would be so bored and so depressed if I'd had to continuously repeat, uh, you know, what I'd already done before. Because I'll never make another Malexican ever, ever again, ever. Unless I go and try and find new ways of expressing myself. Um, so I got, I mean, I just got bored. I'm, you know, I'm a DJ. I look for new records every day. And, you know, I look to be inspired every day. I look to find a way of the same sort of idea but slightly done different so that it becomes fresh again or some sort of cross genre moment that is really really refreshing and this is where I want to be as a human and as an artist and as a DJ I just want to be inspired by everything around me and it means that I can't repeat what I do for too long because again I'll become bored maybe financially it's not the wisest direction to go maybe I should have done 400 Malexicons and I would have been I don't know, Eric Pritz or whatever, but I choose to, yeah, to, to, to keep on developing and, and changing and, and being fresh and inspired and, you know, and, and so, yeah, so The Fruit is obviously a totally different record. And this is Miami to a certain extent, although that sort of moved towards a harder sound, sort of EDM driven. You gotta also remember that when you break through, I came from DJing for a hundred people in The Hague, or actually uh, 10 people in The Hague. <laughs> and, then, and then you make a record like that and all of a sudden you play for 500 people and three years later that sound breaks all over the world and you're playing for 5,000 people. You play different music for 5,000 people than you play for 500 or 10. You know, it's, it's a whole different animal to, 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 to reach. So I started making music that fits that type of arena. It didn't particularly make me very, very happy. I, I like it around the five, six hundred and a little bit more intimate, a little bit more uh, detailed. Um, so yeah, that, that's my journey. I, I just keep on searching. Some of your recent releases are more house, deep house tracks. You did a track about a year ago with soul and disco legend George McRae. How was it to work with him? Yeah, cool. I mean, I've known George for a really long time for uh, various crazy reasons. Um, and he's, he's just an amazing guy. I think, I think he, if we're talking about someone who just fell into this world and, and all of a sudden it's like a 40 year long career, it's probably him because uh, he, maybe not a lot of people know this, but he, did, he obviously did a record that was one of the biggest records in the world ever. I think if you make a top 500 of the biggest records in the world, he, he's probably in there with uh, uh, Rock Me Baby, which has been an insane, like 50 million, to 30 number ones in 30 countries, like crazy number record. Uh, but he wasn't supposed to be on that record. He was just in the studio and the singer, original singer didn't show up and they were like, hey dude, you know, can you sing? It's a bit like Rick Astley and, and Stock Aitken and, and Waterman. I don't know if you know, he's the coffee guy of Stock Aitken and Waterman and all of a sudden he's Rick Astley, the world renowned superstar. It's the same with him and um, with, with George. So. Um, there you go, it's like crazy momentum and then that moment puts you into that place and it you know, catapults you into becoming a star, whether you like it or not. Um, anyway, so I've, I've run into him a few times and we have some mutual friends and yeah, this has been in the making for a long time and funny enough, his ex-wife, uh, Gwen McRae, I did a record with three years ago, which, which was Can You Feel It? Uh, so that's even crazier, so I have <laughs> I've had the whole McRae family uh, in the studio. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those crazy collabs. And uh, I, I remember George coming here and we're hanging out and he, he's telling me these stories. I mean, this is a guy that's been on the road for 40 years. I mean, he's got stories forever. And we're going to this church in, um, up in the, uh, the deep in the, in the north of, of, of the province we live in, uh, nor north of, uh, of Amsterdam. And it's a friend of mine who's got this studio and it's a church. It's like he converted a church into a studio. And yeah, it was a really, really, it was a really beautiful night. We, we had some really good, deep and great conversations, yeah. Are there any other people you would like to work with? Um, I'm working on a, a cool pop project at the moment uh, called Black Neon with a wonderful girl from LA called Sam Bruno. Uh, and that's really, really exciting. It's a, it's a whole different path, different world. But I thought after remixing so many pop stars and having done fairly well with it, I thought I, I wanted to sort of take my uh, take my trade a step further and, and start writing music and you know be more of a producer and that's that's really cool. So 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 that's fun. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I don't have a real specific wish list of people. I mean, the people I really truly admire, I wouldn't really want to work with because they will probably be not as nice as I think they are. You know what I mean? It's like I'd love to work with John Mayer, but but John Mayer is probably a real cocky fuck. You know, who, who who's not really friendly in the studio. I don't know. Maybe he is, but I mean, I I, I was I was with Diplo the other day and. It was, was kind of cool, but you know, all these people on, on that level have a certain, and they should have, they have a certain reservation against the world, sort of like, okay, what's, what's in it for me, what's the trade-off? And you kind of know when you, when you step into a room with people like that, it's, it's kind of like, okay, which always makes it a bit awkward. You know? I'd, I'd like to work with people that no one knows and that I can make fucking famous. That'll be incredible. So which artists or bands do you listen to these days? Ooh, I have a very crazy eclectic taste. Me and my wife, we go through an, an extreme. I mean, we, we love Billie Eilish at the moment. Uh, Halsey is amazing. Uh, Khalid is, is undoubtedly an incredible dude. I love listening to Sway Lee. There's a lot of, of that sort of hip hop that I really, really enjoy. Um, Travis Scott and, and you know in, in sort of that direction. I, we, I, we have a 14 year old running around here in the house with a three year old behind <laughs> behind you. So that's uh, with her. I listen to uh, uh, <coughs> I guess um, um, children's music. Um, <clears throat> we're big fans of Casey Musgraves. Uh, which is a country girl that did a sort of pop crossover album. She just won the Grammy for greatest album of the year. And that's really deservedly so, because it's so incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. I listen to Ross from Friends, who's my favorite DJ. Uh, very weird, eclectic dude, but fantastic. So. Um, it's 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 all it's all over. Just just if it's if it's done from the heart and it's, if it's sincere and exciting, then I'll, I'm listening to it. Whether it's pop or underground or from the past or from the future, it's like doesn't really matter. Is there still anything on your bucket list, music-wise? I want to win a Grammy. Yeah, for best album of the year. <laughs> no, I mean you know, but seriously, for like I don't know, best jazz singer or something. <laughs> never say never. Or, or, or maybe uh, conductor, you know, the best orchestrated piece, you know, that'll be, but just humble. This, these are humble, uh, <laughs> humble longing. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and good luck in the future. Yeah, well, thank you so much. All right, that was it, this week's vlog. My interview with Sander Kleinenberg about my lexicon. Sander, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below and make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you all for watching and until next time, bye bye.